And if Tov, everybody, good evening. It's wonderful to be together. I want to invite and encourage everybody who uh, is able to turn on your video to do so so we can see each other and to please um, make use of the chat over the course of our time together this evening to post questions. We'll have time to field questions from uh, the community um, after our opening conversation. I wanted to begin with a pasuk from this week's parasha that uh, for me frames what we're doing here. It's the pasuk that introduces Yaakov's conversation with his children in which he says, Gather together and I will tell you that which will happen to you in a future time at the end of days and a later time. And maybe it's the gathering together which helps them understand an image of what will happen at the future time. When um, all of B'nai Yaakov can come together and can envision an inclusive and unified community which makes room for everyone's voices, then we see what our dream of the future should look like. And tonight, we have a glimpse of the future that I know we each hope for and dream for and are so honored in our own ways to be paving the path towards as a collective community. A future which because of Rabbi Sara and Ravavi, Rabbi Nichira and others in this Zoom and others around the world, a future which is also the present of empowered and incredible women's spiritual leadership in the modern Orthodox community, and also a future of the gathering together of leadership from the diaspora and Medinat Israel, from America and Israel to share wisdom and to share experiences. So I'm gonna get out of the way uh, and introduce Rabbi Sarah and Rabbi Nichira. Um, Rabbi Sarah, of course, known to all of us um, as our Rabbi uh, and co-founder and president of Maharat, the first, in the first institution to ordain Orthodox women as clergy. Um, and our cherished, cherished uh, rabbi alongside now Rabbi Nit Bracha, who I'm so happy is, of course, with us tonight as well. Um, rabbi Sarah completed Drisha Scholar Circle uh, and uh, learned for an additional five years with Ravavi um, and was ordained by Ravavi and Rabbi Daniel Sperber in 2009. Um, her visionary leadership of Yeshivat Maharat and our community um, has reached so, so many communities. Uh, and is paving the path and is creating the reality today for the Acharit Ayamim, the future that we envision empowering, teaching, and inspiring um, women spiritual leaders and women and men in our community at every age and background uh, and partnering across denominations and across all communities. Rabbanit Shira Marili Mervis is the Rabbanit of Shirat HaTamar congregation in Efrat and as such uh, serves in Israel as the first sole female spiritual leader of an Orthodox congregation and community. Uh, she um, completed her training at uh, Midrash at Lindenbaum's Institute for Halachic Leadership, um, which runs a very parallel kind of track to um, the Israeli Chief Rabbinate's Smicha program, training in spiritual leadership and in the vast areas of Halacha to serve and lead a community. Uh, she's been active um, in uh, mikvah work in Hevra Kadisha, answering halachic questions through Beit Hillel's organization that reaches so many people seeking through the internet uh, halachic guidance and in her own community really organically grew as a sought after uh, teacher and, uh, and, and Morat Halacha. Uh, she teaches uh, Daf Yomi and Mazal Tov on the Siyum on Masechet Ta'anit um, and may we merit to learn many more Masechetot together. Uh, and she has a, a, a blog on Daf Yomi and on Parashat Shavua um, and uh, is a fellow in the Mandel Program for Leadership in Jewish Culture. These are just to name a few things. And uh, tonight, what we're going to have an opportunity to do is hear Rabbi Sarah and Rabbi Nitshira engage each other in conversation, uh, drawing out their experiences, their day-to-day -day work, and their visions for spiritual leadership for our communities uh, for about a half hour. Um, feel free to post questions in the chat along the way, and we'll have time for Q&A when we conclude. Thank you to both of you for being our mentors and teachers. 
Thanks for Stephen. Um, it is lovely to be here tonight with all of you and uh, and of course with you, Robin Ichira. Um, we have just met. We met today. We had the opportunity to to dialogue a little bit in front of the students of Yeshivat Maharat, which was a real treat for for them to get to to know you. Um, and for me to get to know you a little bit, of course, I, I heard about you through the, the media splash, um, but I, I'm looking forward to this conversation to get to know each other a little bit deeper. So the community has a, a little bit of a sense of, of my journey and who I am. I've been ordained since 2009 and I've been serving at the Hebrew Institute since, you know, 2003 or, or so. And, um, and I in in during that journey also founded maharat and uh, continued to serve the bayat very part time but my main role is at maharat so that's 3 seconds of my journey we would love to hear a little bit about your journey how did you how did you get to be a, a rabbinit and a, a leader of um, the solo leader of a congregation in Ephrat? i'd love to hear a little bit about your journey okay so shalom everyone thank you so much for having me and taking the time to hear us. Um, so three years ago, uh, Shlomo and I, with our kids, we moved uh, and we bought a house in the Tamar neighborhood, which is a new neighborhood in Efrat. And we joined a group of people that established a shul, a new shul in the, in the neighborhood. Uh, the people in the community knew that I was learning halacha. I was in my middle of uh, my Machon uh, Ilchatil Nashim, the Women Institute for Women in Midrash Lintenbaum. I was in the middle of my learning in my third year. It's a five years program. And they knew that I was learning halacha, so they started asking me questions. At the beginning, it was just women and mainly in the topic of Tarata Mishpacha. But slowly, le'at uh, le'at, people started asking me questions in all eras of life. Um, I started giving shiurim in the community. I started saying the divrei Torah in the community. And I think the moment that I understood that maybe I'm uh, filling up a role of a rabbanit was when the Gabai gave me a call two, two years ago. And he asked me to give the Dvar Torah before Tkiat Shofar, before the blowing of the Shofar on Rosh Hashanah. And I said to the Gabai, whoa, you know what you're asking of me? Kilu, do you, are you sure that you want me to speak then? Kilu, maybe someone else? And he said, no, you're the rabbinit of the community and we want you to speak before the blowing of the Shofar. And then, and then I understood that it's becoming something that it's a bit more than just a informal kind of a helping out to whoever I can. Uh, I kept on learning. I kept on being a uh, part of the community. And then six months ago, around six months ago, Rabbi Riskin gave me a call and he told me, he said that he knows that I'm a, not officially, but I'm doing the work of a rabbinit of the community. And he wants to make it official. He wants to ordain me. He wants, he knows that I'm, I'm finishing my school, my learning this year. And he wants to make it official. He wants the community to, to nominate me and he wants to give me his blessing. And um, so we started a community process in which we had a lot of asifot chaverim, we had a lot of uh, discussions and pros and cons, and I wasn't part of all of that process. I wanted to let the community um, feel free to have their discussion without um, fearing of, uh, of uh, hurting me or something. So I wanted them to be able to speak freely. So Shlomo and I were, was, were not taking part of the, all of the discussions. And at the end of that process, there was a vote, an anonymous vote, and uh, they voted yes. Uh, at that, that night at 10 o'clock, the board of the community came over to my house and to give me the answer and to tell me that there was a majority for my uh, nomination. And we had a lechaim and I was crying. And then uh, the head of the board uh, said, well, you know, usually in a community, when someone chooses or nominate a rabbi, the first thing that you do is that is on Shabbat, you will ask him to come read the Torah. You would uh, give him a aliyah la Torah. Uh, but I don't know, how are we in our community? What are we going to do with you? We're going to let Shlomo go up for the Torah, but what does it do? It's not you. And we want to respect you and respect the moment in the community. Um, 
So at the beginning, we were mamash laughing at it, but then we understood that it's a real question. How do you pay respect to a woman in the community? Um, um, uh, at the end, I, uh, I said a Dvar Torah during that Shabbat and they threw candy at me and everyone was singing and that was it. But, uh, it opens a whole discussion in the community, in the board, like how, what do we do? Uh, so a week later, after the, after the vote, a week later, we had a ceremony only for the families of the community and uh, Rabbi Riskin and my Rav, Rav Shuki Reich, and uh, the community nominated me and then Rabbi Riskin ordained me and I was crying for two hours <laughs> and uh, Ken, and it was very, very emotional, very exciting. And ever since I'm, uh, I have the title of the Rabbanit of the Keila. Beautiful, thank you. I notice in both of our stories that there are male rabbis who are relevant and significant to the journey. In, in my story, of course, there's Rabbi Avi who tapped me on the shoulder and sent me on my, my journey. And uh, for you, it was, it was Rabbi Riskin. I think that's you know, the, that notion um, that there are those who are senior to us and men who can step back and, and notice how to push women forward is, is really beautiful. I think maybe one day, Bezrat Hashem, it, it won't matter if it's a man or a woman rabbi, it doesn't matter who it will be that will pass it along. But I think that for today, for, for now, for these years, I think it's very important. And I, Mamash, I can rely on Rav Riskin. And I know that I have like very uh, broad shoulders that I can lean on and I can consult with, and it's very meaningful, both to the community and to me. For sure, for sure. So should we talk about our titles? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so go for it. Why Rabbanit? And then I'll, I'll say why Rabba. Okay, um, first of all, I think it's a bit different, Israel and, and outside of Israel. In Israel, Rabba uh, would be conservative or reform. And because what we're doing or what I am, what I would, am doing is, uh, is new in Israel, it was very important for me that people will recognize me with the Orthodox movement and not with the conservative and reform. And I have nothing against Chas Khalila, the reform or the conservative movement, our brothers and sisters, I love them dearly, good for them. It's just, it's not me. Uh, and I identify myself as an Orthodox woman, and it's important for me to identify myself as an Orthodox woman. Uh, so it's been actually a process of thinking about it with a lot of women that are Talmidot Chachamim, and they're like after finishing our learning, our studies, so how do we call ourselves? And uh, I love the Rabbanit uh, because I think it's time to do reclaiming to the word. Um, I'm a Rabbanit not because I'm married to a rabbi, and everyone who knows Shlomo knows that. Shlomo is a startup, has a startup company. So he's in the high-tech area and he has nothing to do with Rabbanut besides me. And, uh, and Rabbanit is reclaiming the name and reclaiming the words to say, if you're a Rabbanit, you're a woman that is because of yourself, because of what you've learned, you deserve the title of being a Rav woman. So, uh the story of how we got to Rabbah and then all of the titles that come out of Maharat is a story that I'm not sure that my community knows. Many years ago, when I, right before I was ordained in 2008, Blue Greenberg hosted a series of focus groups to try to get a sense of what the title would be for this phenomenon of Orthodox women serving in clergy um, as spiritual leaders. And Rav Avi and Blue together decided that there were gonna be certain rules. And they determined that um, at any RB sounding title, Rabba, Rabbanit, um, Rav, <laughs> the Orthodox community was not ready for those titles yet. And so we, uh, um, Blue got, gets up in front of the group and delivers the rules. We have to think out of the box. We have to think of the right title, but it can't sound like the word rabbi. It has to be a little bit distinct. And so she delivers this message. She sits down and the first person puts up her hand and says, I have an idea. How about we call her rabbi? 
And I that that moment was both shocking <laughs> after the rules were set. And for me, it was a real moment of, of stepping into the role of rabbi. I looked at this room of people who saw me as, as a rabbi and saw that the job I was performing and the role I was playing was rabbi. And I think it really helped me sort of emerge into, into the role. Um, after the series of conversations, we did come up with a the acronym. Um, Maharat is Manhiga Hilchati Rochanit Tarnit, which is a a description of the job of what a rabbi does, a leader in spiritual and Torah endeavors. Um, and I was called Maharat Sarah. Some of you remember that I had three titles in one year. I was Madricha Rochanit, and then I was Maharat. And then a few months after, there was very little pushback, very little noise, and. Um, and we decided that we should find a title that that helped people understand more clearly what I was doing. And so we decided Rabba. Why Rabba, not Rabbanit? I too felt like there was a reclaiming. I felt too that that I knew that Rabba was associated with the reform movement in Israel, but I, I was committed as well to this notion of, of reclaiming. And I was worried that in, in America, at least, Rabbanit was still too associated with the, the, the Rebetzin role to reclaim it as fast. And so I thought that Rabba would be, would be redefined a little faster. Um, that's, of course, when there was a whole firestorm. And, um, uh, and very quickly, when, when we started ordaining our students out of Maharat, we realized that that title was the thing that people wanted to uh, fight about and get frustrated about and, and, and get, uh, get worried about. And so we decided that our policy is that any woman with their hiring institution can determine their own title, which is why we have Rabbanit Bracha over here. Um, and we have Maharat and we have Rabba and we have Rabbi. Um, and who knows what would have been if I decided in 2009 to reclaim Rabbanit and not Rabba. Maybe we would all be Rabbanit and that would be, uh, that would be sort of interesting for us to all have the, the, same, the same title. I think what's interesting is to, to ask, how do, you, how do they call your husband? <laughs> if you're the rabbah, then what's your husband name in the community? I think jo what he would say is Josh. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> he says, call me Josh. Um, he, he likes rabbit's man sometimes. <laughs> Shlomo loves rabbit's man. He says it's like <laughs> Superman, but with a rabbi. So I think I think mostly he likes not being called. That's the truth. He he likes to <laughs> leave the job of a spiritual leadership to me. Um, and while he you know he enjoys shul um, to an extent, <laughs> um, he he leaves the 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 role of of shul life to to me, <laughs> which is convenient. That helps. Like who takes Definitely. everybody wants to know who takes care of the kids on Shabbat morning, right? Uh, I, I make my kids come with me to shul, everyone. I wake up everyone, they all have to come. They don't have an option. I, I'm not a big believer in democracy. I don't know if it's allowed to say it's recorded. But uh, yeah, so I, I bring everyone to shul. Sounds like they also sit quietly in Davin during shul. <laughs> I haven't figured that so, out. <laughs> it depends on the age. I have five, Baruch Hashem. So that my oldest is 16 and my youngest is seven. Uh, so the young ones, first of all, it's part of, I think it's part of the challenge as the community. I'm really looking for, for ways to leave the kids in the tefillah and to make the tefillah interesting for them and, and to make them take part in tefillah. So it's, I, I see it uh, that the challenge that I have with my own kids as a community challenge, it's not my own challenge as a mom. Um, but uh, Ken, they come in and they go out and they come back and forth and Ken, Baruch Hashem. So Rabbi Nichir, I wanted to, to uh, discuss a phenomenon that I'm seeing in, um, in America. It was actually based on an article written by Erica Brown, but certainly something that Rav Ezra and Rav Steven and Rabbi Bracha and I have been talking about, about whether people the, the, how the state of COVID has impacted our community and, um, and whether people are coming back to shul. So I wanna ask you, you know, just generally about you know, shul post COVID, uh, but also a little bit about the phenomenon that Erica Brown talks about, which is that women in particular are not coming back to shul. 
maybe it's because they weren't so invested in shul. They weren't seeing, they didn't feel like they were participating in shul um, before COVID. And now COVID has just exasperated and accelerated the fact that they weren't feeling so part of the community. So I'm wondering if that, if you see that in your community, and if you don't, maybe you can just say how women um, and men, but how the participants in your shul feel like they're part of the Kihila, part of the community. So I think it very much depends what had happened during COVID. Uh, so I don't know how did you deal with COVID, but in our community, Mamash at the early ages of the COVID, when we started understanding what's going on, we spoke among us in the board and we said, it's a make it or break it time for the community. It's either we're gonna shut down for a year, two years, however long COVID will take, or we're gonna be able to survive and maintain the community and come out stronger. Uh, Baruch Hashem, I think we came out stronger. We fought for it. We did Zoom evenings and we did packages for the people who were isolated and for the sick ones and we did parties over the Zoom whenever we could. And we were trying to be as creative as possible. And when the coronation was done in Israel and we were allowed out, we started davening in the parking lot in between two buildings. Um, and what was interesting, everyone was out in the streets, right? Everyone was davening in the streets of Efrat. But in our shul, I insisted that we're gonna bring out the mechitza. And people started arguing with me not, not in a bad way, but just saying, you know, we don't have to have a mechitza right now because it's aray and, you know, halachically. And I said, I know that maybe halachically, like the, the dry halacha, maybe there's no need for a mechitza, but I want to, uh, uh, by kilu I want to create a space for women. I want women to feel that there is a space made for them outside in the parking lot. And therefore, when I'm putting that mechitza out and we actually rolled the mechitza out like the wooden mechitzot, we ruled them out of the, the Beit Knesset and we brought them to the parking lot. And by that, there was always room made for the women and they always knew that I was there. I mamash uh, tried to be the first one to come and the last one to leave. And I remember during Slichot, in one of the nights, I, we were in the park and with the mechitzot and there were tons of men and I was all by myself. And the next evening, it was midnight and someone came and she said, I knew you're gonna be here by yourself. I didn't want you to be by yourself, so I came. So when, when people know that you're standing there and that you're, you're out there and there's a room for women and there's space for women made for them, so they, they come, they participate. So I feel like throughout COVID, women were part of the community just like the men, mamash, kilu, completely, just like in regular days, just like inside the shuls. And therefore, when we, Baruch Hashem, came back into the, into, we daven in a, in a kindergarten. We rent a kindergarten from the Moatza, and every Friday we tidy it up, make it into a shul, and then on Motei Shabbat we come back and tidy it up again as a kindergarten. So when we got back into the kindergarten, everyone just came very naturally because there was no break throughout the COVID. Uh, in other shuls, in just in our neighborhood, we have seven different communities. We are one out of seven. And all the other communities, they didn't have a mechitza outside for the women. And a lot of women did not come out during the COVID, during, uh, because it was cold, it was mabet, it was uncomfortable. It was cold or it was hot and it was the sound and the volume and the kids and it was hard. So when after not going to shul for two years and then all of a sudden to go back to it, then it's hard. When there's such a big break in the middle, I think it's hard. Um, I don't know what it's like in other shuls. In my shul, Baruch Hashem, we're happy to be inside. So what do you do on a, on a, a Shabbat? What is your job? What does it look like from the time you arrive in shul to the end of Kiddush? That's a, that's a great question. I don't know. What is that? I, I, I'm just, I'm there. I'm there and I'm, I'm davening. I'm trying to daven and I'm enjoying my community. If there's halachic questions that comes up, then I'll be the one to answer it. I'll give you an example. Um, way before the ceremony and the ordain and while I was learning Bamash a year ago, uh, in the middle of Kriyat Torah, we were in the parking lot. So Kriyat Torah, they were standing there, Haolel Torah, the Chazan, the Gabai, the like five men standing around the Sefer Torah, and all of a the sudden they stopped the reading, 
And one of the men like pulled the curtain of the mechitza and he says, Rabbi Chira, can you please come over? And I walked, I left the women's section and I went into the men's section and into the bima. And they said, we have a question here about the letter, one of the letters in the Sefer Torah. It looks like it's a bit, it's not exactly a letter. And we wanted to, to, to say, Kilu, can you please give us a psak? Can we continue reading or is it pasul? Pasul o kosher. So I answered whatever I answered and I went back and I sat in my seat in my Ezrat Nashim. And uh, women were asking me like, what was going on? Why, why did we stop? And uh, I said, well, there was just a halachic question and we moved on and we continued. Um, so when there's halachic questions in the kihila, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm answering the halachic questions. I give the Dvar Torah, I give the drasha on Shabbat morning. Um, I, um, can, I talk to everyone basically. <laughs> Um, should we talk about what's like the hardest part of the, the, the job? <laughs> yeah, so definitely. Maybe we'll hardest, most surprising and the most comforting, the best part. I think the hardest and the best are the same in a weird way. Uh, the hardest and the best is to be exposed to the heartbreaks and the pain of uh, so many people that I know and I love. Um, and all of a sudden becoming the Rabbanit, I feel like a curtain is being pulled and people are sharing with me their life and their trouble and their heartaches. And uh, I'm trying to help as much as I can. Um, it, it surprised me every time how many questions can start as a simple halachic question and end up with me and the person crying in my living room over whatever it is that they're sharing. Um, a lot of the questions starts as a halakha question, then they go to become to be much, much complicated than that, much more complicated than that. So I, I feel like I've been exposed to people's life and it's a huge shlichut for me. And, um, so it's, and I'm very grateful for people that they feel comfortable to share their life with me. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, my davening is completely different ever since I became a rabbinit. I feel like my davening is, uh, it, it's just that so, can, I'm exposed to a lot of pain. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree that the relationships that you build with people and the idea that, that uh, people, you know, the responsibility that people give me and us um, to, uh, help treasure and listen and hold whatever they're going through. And then to help usher through the, those liminal moments, whether it's, it's end of life or uh, burial or times of joy and weddings. Um, do you do life cycle events? Are, are there are there an opportunity for funerals and, and weddings? I know that's different uh, as well with the Rabban. Ken, uh, Ken so... Um, first of all, I'm Chevra Kadisha in Efrat, and, and people know that. So whenever there's a funeral, even for people that are not in my community, but from the neighborhood or from Efrat in general, so they often ask the questions or, or are going to the funeral to help out or whatever is needed. In my community, we just had uh, a few people in my community, actually, that were sitting Shiva, and I was around there, uh, Ken, Mamash. Uh, chatunot, we don't have chatunot, everyone are, we don't have really chatunot, but we have a lot of bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah. And that's something that I found that I love the most. I have a chavruta with every bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, girl or boy. Uh, and, and it's surprisingly, I, I, I thought it's gonna be a burden, but it's amazing, I love it. I, I sit and I learn with them their parasha, just to divrei Torah about their parasha. And it's and it's it's amazing. The youth in the community, it's a uh, it's great part that I love. So true. What's the reception been like? How's it been in the larger community in Efrat in Israel? How have people supported or denigrated you? So it's actually amazing because we felt like we were doing something very personal, like a community process. We had a whole month of discussions and talks and. We felt it was very, very personal. And all of a sudden, after the ceremony, the, after the vote, and 
and becoming, I don't know, the, the echo, the media that we got for it was shocking, both for me and for the community. Like we got a headlines in Ynet and the Jerusalem Post and Makor Rishon and whatever. And, and it was very surprising for us to understand that our personal story is not so personal, that it's actually something that is happening in the world or influencing the orthodoxy in, in a way. And we didn't aim for it. Like we didn't think that it's gonna be such a big deal. We just thought that we're doing a process, community process of choosing a leadership to the community. And we didn't think it's gonna be such a huge, big deal. Mm -hmm. um, but what, is, what about the, the Efrat community specifically? Was, is there support like right in the neighboring communities? Uh, so, Ken, Mamash, I get a lot of support, Mamash, even from communities that I know that they disagree with our community. They are, even from people that I know that won't come and daven with us, uh, but I got a lot of support in the community, got a lot of support. And I think it's because people knew us. It wasn't something that people didn't know who, who they were talking about or what was the story like. People knew me and people knew the community and people knew that we were going through that process. So it wasn't like a big surprise in Efrat, but then all the media and all the balagan that was around it. And then we got a lot of support from, uh, from people around us. People always ask me if anyone said something bad or came against it. And the truth is that I've never heard. I'm sure that there are people that don't like it or don't disapprove of, of me or of the role. I'm sure that not everyone are happy with it, but. For me personally, no one, uh, no one came to say anything. Great. So I know I've been dominating, and I want to give you a chance to ask us questions. Let me you question me questions. You to ask me a question, but just to just to give you a, a moment to think. Where is this going? Where is the the uh, phenomenon of of female spiritual leadership going? Where is the future? Um, and how long is it going to take us to get to whatever that future is? Like, where do you see us or where do you see this, this movement of women in clergy positions in five years and 10 years? I think we're going towards Geula. <laughs> um, and I think uh, I'm very Lubavitch in that way. And that Geula would mean that women and men will be able to take part in the spiritual world, in Torah world, and it will be gender blind meaning if it will be Torah that will connect us, if it will be Torah that we, that we appreciate, that have depth, then we will learn it and we will listen to it. And it wouldn't matter if it comes from a man or from a woman. How long will it take us to get there? It's a very good question. I don't know. I think, I don't know in America, but in Israel, Torah learning for women is flourishing and it's beautiful to see the Batei Midrash are full. And Baruch Hashem, and we have so many programs, not just for a year in Israel, like a year before Shavutumi or before army and after the army, but also in depth, Gemara, Halacha Be'iyun, Gemara Be'iyun, for Mamash women my age and older, and I think it's amazing. Uh, what I'm hoping to see that it will uh, linger to the shuls, that it will linger, that flourishing will happen in the Batei Knesset as well. And we're not gonna just leave it in the Beit Midrash. And I'm, Bemet, I'm hoping not to be the sole leader for many, for a long time. I'm hoping there will be a lot of women that will be able to take part in Batei Knesset. Doesn't matter if it's alongside a rabbi or by themselves, it doesn't really matter for me. I think the, the dual leadership is beautiful and I think it's a good model and every shul should decide for himself what's good for them as long as there's something. Who knows, maybe in America as well, in five and 10 years, every Orthodox shul will have a, a female spiritual leader as well. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we'll need a little more time, but um, okay. Time. Do you have a question for me? <laughs> so actually I do, I thought about it. Uh, I just spent the Shabbat at the IAC. It's the Israel American uh, Conference. It's a a lot of Israelis that have an American identity that immigrated from Israel to America. And they started talking about their Israeli identity and how to create a Jewish identity without being in Israel. And I told them, and, and again, I'm very Israeli, it was not really PC to say, 
But I told them, you don't have to reinvent anything, Ken, because the Jewish nation have lived in outside of Israel for the last 3000 years. And basically Bavel is the place where Torah flourished and we wrote the Gemara, not we, not I, but Ken, the nation wrote the Gemara. So do you think Torah can flourish outside of Israel? Because do you, do you think that today Gemara would have been able to be written outside of Israel? Do you see outside of Israel as being the, the main place in the world for Torah to flourish? Or do you think it's happening in Israel? Or do you think it's happening in both places? And how do we create a, a bridge in between those two Torahs? Because the last thing that I want to see is Talmud Bavli ve Talmud Yerushalmi. I think that maybe today we should try and create a Torah that will be relevant for everyone and, I don't know, bridging over geographical uh, places. Absolutely, I agree. And, you know, even in the Bavli and Yerushalmi, there were those few rabbis who traveled back and forth and they were too far and few in between. Um, but I think it was those rabbis who had a deeper perspective on both being uh, having the Torah of the outsider and the insider. And I think having both perspectives of what it is to be a Jew outside of Israel and a Jew inside of Israel um, is necessary for what the future of the Jewish community is going to look like. I think it's true, just like you said, there's 3000 years of Jews in Gula in diaspora Jewry. And I think that's not going to change. I think the idea that all the Jews are going to suddenly immigrate to Israel is is not is not a is is just not going to happen. And I think that creating the uh, the uh, vibrant centers of of Torah has already happened in America, and I think needs to continue to be supported. I do think just to underscore your question um, and your your comment that figuring out how to um, navigate the bridge is is so important. Um, we can speak the language of Torah and find similarities and find um, ways to connect over women's leadership, what's hard, what's what's easy, what's um, uplifting. Um, we can have a harusa from across across the ocean. And I, I wonder what the what the common language um, can be for on the on a cultural level, on a social level, so that Israelis and Americans in general, even when there isn't the language of Torah um, to cement us, how we can keep thinking about what that that uh, that language can be to keep us, you know, aligned and marching forward together and not feeling like two disparate people. Ken, Ken, there's a lot of work to be done. I think there's a lot that we can do. So in terms of, of um, work to do, and I think this is, is this the last question before we open it up? I'm not sure. Um, I would love to hear about, um, I, and I'm happy to share as well my perspective, but I'd love to hear your perspective on patience, patience and anger. I think it's a, a question I get a lot of, of don't, aren't you angry that you don't count in a minyan or, um, mm -hmm. You know, what is the role of patience in this position and this job? Um, and what is the role of anger in this position and job? I'm not angry. I'm not. Um, and sometimes people tell me that as a criticism. Why aren't you more angry? Um, and I understand. I understand that I maybe I should be, but I can't fake it. <laughs> I'm not angry. Um, I accept the boundaries of orthodoxy with love. I, I love halakha and I accept the boundaries. Would I want to be counted to Minyan? Yes. Uh, am I going to be counted to Minyan? No. <laughs> um, that's the way it is. And I accept it. I took a decision uh, to be obligated to halakha and it's a conscious decision and there's benefits to it and there's things that are hard for me. And it's fine. It's okay by me. I'm I'm okay with it. I I I believe in it and I love it. And that's what I choose. And I think that's feminism. For me, feminism is being able to choose what is right for me. And I think halakha is right for me and orthodoxy is right for me, even though there are parts that I want that I wanted to hopefully maybe it will change one day. Aval, uh, for now, no, I'm not counted for Minyan and I'm not reading from the Torah. 
and I don't have tefillin and I don't have a talit. And I'm envy at my son who just had a bar mitzvah, COVID bar mitzvah, and he got a talit and tefillin. And I'm, yes, I'm envy and it's fine and it's okay. Vemet. <laughs> So I go through phases of, of um, trying to consciously use anger to propel a movement forward and also letting go of anger. I think it's true in order to, to get to, I think where both of us have, I think anger is not the, the emotion that's helpful. Um, Ravavi always says, you know, consider how much more energy it takes to be angry. Um, so I think it's true that that there there's not um, often a place for anger, and I think that I am mostly really privileged and um, grateful that I'm doing something that I love, and I can't imagine what else I would be doing if it was not this. Um, at the same time, there there's that that rumbling in my belly sometimes where I just I want something faster and and. And um, I, I want there to be more momentous opportunities and uh, change within the boundaries of the community, within the boundaries of halacha. Um, and I started to think recently that that's okay because it's that fire in the belly, that's that that passion um, that maybe doesn't have to be called anger, but that passion that that brings about change. Um, and that change happens from the ground up. It happens from from women and people showing up and saying, I'm here. I count, I matter. Um, let's see how we can serve the, the, the full community with men and women equally being there. No, you're right. And I also think that I'm very privileged not to be angry. It is just you know, because of angry women in just a couple of years ago, I am able to be where I'm, I'm at today. So I'm not blind to the power of being angry. I just think that being angry, it's, I'm, I'm angry about other topics. For example, agunot can make me crazy and, and can send me out to demonstrate in the street. Agunot can do that. And Bihlal, the whole idea of, of uh, sexual harassment from authority within a community, with a rabbi, stuff like that. These are things that will make me angry. Not being counted to minyan, less. I admit, less less angry. Um, but uh, Ken, I do win. Th I do want things to. I, I identify with you. I do have the feeling of the frustration of wanting things to move, and sometimes the feeling that they're moving so fast, and on the other hand, that they're not moving at all. So, Nachon. Um, okay, Rabbi Bracha is going to moderate some questions that we have. Welcome. Thank you. Benichira, it's, it is such an honor and a pleasure. You couldn't see me beaming, but with every answer that you gave, I'm nodding and saying, yes, yes, uh -huh, yeah, exactly. But I'm in awe and I'm so delighted. I'm Israeli also, and I'm just so delighted to hear this from an Israeli Rabbanit and to think that this is happening in Israel. I'm just completely delighted and floored and happy. So I have the honor of reading some of the questions from the chat, and I do have a couple of questions of my own, but I first want to, I first want to read some of the questions. I think you answered some of them, but I'm also left with the question. Rabbi Moshe Edelman asked two, it's kind of a few parter. One of them is, where do you stand? We already heard that you walked into the men's section, went up to the Bima to answer a lucky question about the Sevatar. And Rabbi Sperber always says, you can take your time answering certain questions, but not Hilchot Beit Knesset. You got to know to answer them right away on the spot. So Baruch Hashem, it sounds like you did. Where do you stand when you give your Dvar Torah? Do you move the Mechitza? Uh, so this is part of the reason why we are starting a process of building a shul, because I think in order to have women talking in shul, the, the structure needs to allow it. Meaning, if uh, I was once asked to give a Dvar Torah in a shul in Yerushalayim, where the woman was sitting in the second, second floor, and I had to come down and then cross the men's section and then stand and give a Dvar Torah, only looking at men. And it was really embarrassing for me. Uh, so in our shul, the way that it works, um, we have the men and the woman and the mechitza in the middle, standing in the middle, and then the bima is at the front, and behind it, the Aron Kodesh. So I'm standing after the Aron Kodesh in front of the Bima, and then I'm able to see both the men and the women. 
Uh, I'll send you an email later. The, you'll see, you'll be able to see the structure of the Bit Knesset that we put a lot of thought into it, like how to create a space that will allow and will make everyone feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. okay, come and look at our show. I think you'll see something similar, just a little bit bigger. <laughs> and I tell you, but he had other questions. I saw that somebody posted that a woman can read the Haftarah by you and there's a sign up sheet. Is, and Rabbi Edelman also asked, can a woman ever be a shlichat sibur, ba'alat kriya? And this feels like it's moving to the direction of a partnership minyan or minyan mechabed, what's called. So if you could so, tell okay. us we're, about that. We're not called, there's, in Israel, there's minyan shivyoni, like the equal minyan, and we're not an equal minyan because- Called egalitarian here. Egalitarian, yeah. So there's no egalitarian. I think in orthodoxy, it doesn't really work. Um, there, no, but it's it's not equal. Halakha is not equal. Um, so we are what we call minyan meshatif. Uh, so yes, women can read the haftara from within the Ezrat Nashim, meaning the bima mm. is long enough. So it's half in the Ezrat Nashim and half in the Ezrat Gvarim. So when a woman reads the haftara, we say the brachot of the haftara and we say the haftara from within the 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 Ezrat Nashim, um, women can so say. So that's Hilal sorry, you said Mishatef. You called it Mishatef. Yeah, Mishatef, exactly. Okay. And not Shitufi. Okay. Um, it's the same word. It could be Shitufi. Yeah. No, because a Minyan Shitufi has women also reading from the Torah and leading certain parts. No. So it's a mamash. It's very in Israel. There's a whole spectrum. Um, uh, there's a whole spectrum in Israel of how much shitufi you can be. Uh, so uh, we're going according to Rabbi Riskin. Like when we established you, so we decided the Rabbi Riskin will be the one to tell us the boundaries of how much Meshatef can we be. And, uh, and Rabbi Riskin actually disagree with Rav Sperber regarding uh, Kiri Abba Torah. Uh, it's a whole halach discussion, look into it. Um, so we're not, we don't have women reading the Torah and we don't have women chazanit, not for Kabbalat Shabbat and not for Ked Zimra. The only thing that we have is a woman reading the Haftarah. Women can say the Tfilah Leshlom Amdina. Girls under Bat Mitva can sing Anim Zmirot. And obviously the Sefer Torah is going the whole circle and we have a Rabbanit. <laughs> right, let's not forget that. The jewel. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to add a question of my own. As somebody who lived in Israel, I lived in Ranana, and, and I was part of a show for many, many years. And I've not seen in Israel very often this model of what I would call, I'll call it an American rabbi, although it's in other places, Chutz La'aretz, where the rabbi is actually a pastoral figure, Livoy Ruchani, and uh, conducts life cycle events, in Israel, it's much, much less common. And I'm I'm amazed that your community saw a need for this because Israelis very often, and I'm Israeli, so maybe I can say that. I'm also Israeli, bristle at the idea. You know, they don't really like the idea of somebody telling them what to do or knowing better or however you however you want to say it. And I'm I'm delighted to see this, and I find it so interesting that it's a woman who's the one stepping into a role like that in Israel. And, and my question would be, is this prevalent? Are there other shoals like this? Because like, I, I don't know so many Batei Knesset in Israel that offer this kind of model of a rabbi. So first of all, you're right. For example, in our neighborhood, in the Tamar, there are seven different Batei Knesset, seven different communities. We are one out of seven. And all the other six decided that they don't want a rabbi. They don't want <laughs> someone. And I think it's a, it's a topic for a PhD, for a research uh, about the religious Zionist movement in Israel, that more and more shuls decide uh, that they don't want to have a rabbi. And also in my community, there was a discussion. Do we want a rabbi? And the answer was no. And then they've asked, do we want a woman rabbi? Do we want a rabbanit? And the answer was no. And when the question was, do we want Shira to be the Rabbanit? The answer was yes. Wow. It's, uh, and, it's, and I think it's different because they knew me. And, and so it wasn't threatening. It wasn't intimidating. Um, as far as life circle, um, I think 
just because I'm a rabbanit and not a rabbi, I don't have the beard and the button down shirt, the white shirt. I think it gives me so much option to do whatever I want because I'm not obligated to the to what people have in their mind, to their expectation of what a rav of a community should do. And that's why I'm doing whatever I want, if it's okay to say. Um, and I'm just doing what I feel feel right. Um, I had the privilege of learning Livui uh, Ruchani. I don't know how you say that. Pastoral. Uh, pastoral. So I, I was learning pastoral with Rav Mike Schultz, and it was an amazing, oh, yeah. amazing uh, and uh, it gave me a lot of tools that I'm actually, I think I'm trying to apply in my community. And uh, Ken, it's, I do whatever I want, basically. <laughs> it looks like you're doing the right things. I want to add a few questions. Uh, can I just ask while you're reading that question, Rabbi Bracha, who pays your salary? The Honey Foundation. There's, I don't know if you've heard of the Honey Foundation, but they give me a scholarship uh, for two years. So it's, it's interesting here. So it's interesting that, that the community, there isn't a phenomenon of the community sort of gravitating to raise money to pay for you. It's outside funds. Because it's very not common in Israel to pay right. a rabbi. So I want to just say that we have the advantage of history on our side. So with the first person who was called a congregational intern, interned, I think, I don't know if I have the exact date, but it was about 1991. Um, at Lincoln Square Synagogue so for a congregational intern. And it was also like external funds. There was funding that paid for these little positions for it was first part time and then maybe it's a little bit more full time. And over the years, slowly, slowly, I think hopefully with the help of, of Maharad and, and, and other institutions, it's the, the job is, is becoming a, a part of um, the budget, so to speak, rather than an externally paid for position. So I hope that that is, is what will be for your shul as well. Ken, I hope so. I think it's a process and I'm hoping it's the natural development of it. And I hope it will, Ken, it will happen. Um, I have a question here from somebody. I'm going to read the question. How do you see women leadership in shuls in Israel ultimately playing out in marriage issues or funeral and burial issues in Israel? Will this ultimately change, I guess, the role of women? I'm not 100% sure what the question is. Does it mean in our role in marriage or is it just in our role in leading, conducting weddings or funerals? Um, or how do you see that playing out in Israel? Uh, so I, I, here in Israel, you have to be part of the Rabbanut in order to lechaten, in order to, to do the chupa. So right. I can't do that. Uh, so I'm not doing that. I am part of the, I am part of the funeral and shiva and all of that. I do take part with it. Um, and I think it's not that the role of women in shul will change uh, the roles of women and men. But I think the world is changing. I think the role of women and men in marriage at Bichlal in the family is developing all the time. It's growing all the time. And I think every couple and every person needs to find their right balance of what they want and how they want their relationship to look like and to, and to be. Take uh, one last question here. Do you think having shul service community centers is the best way to do it. Perhaps it would be more equal if community centers would exist outside of shoals and shoals are only for, that somebody wrote this to, to the chat, that would only serve as a place for tefillah. Do you believe in it that way? Would that help um, to divide? Um, I'm, I'm working very hard in order to change people perspective that Bit Knesset, it's not only a minyan because minyan is 10 men davening and <laughs> Bit Knesset, I think it's a kehila. And I'm very working really hard into changing people perspective in my community and Bichlal in Israel to, to start thinking as Bit Knesset as a kehila, as a community. And I want there to be room and place and voice for men, for women and for children. 
And I think it's very important that the family will come to shul. And I think it's very important that every family will have to feel that as a crucial part of their life and their avodat Hashem. So I think community is a very strong, uh, powerful tool. Sounds like we have that in common um, between our shuls. Our, our shul, I think, really ascribes to the model of a tefillah, not a minyan. Um, even if when there are multiple tefillah going on, that they're part of a, a this, uh, idea of tefillah rather than, than 10 men making up a, a service. And I think that we like to think of ourselves as mission driven. We're, we're not just about showing up and, and davening, although that is a core of we are and what we serve, but it's really about bringing community together, having conversations like this, um, and thinking about, uh, you know, being the best people and connecting in the best way with people that we can. Uh, well, Benit, it's, we want to thank you. Really, Mikhail of Lev, from the bottom of our hearts, this is so wonderful to feel your energy, see your smile, to see how much you appreciate and love the work that you're doing, and appreciate the kavod and the makom, the place that you were given, and we're we are supporting you 100% and look forward to more opportunities to connect. And um, we'll now say good night to everybody, but as Rav Ezra has introduced this minhag by us, we will leave through breakout rooms as if you're in the elevator or on the stairs with some